We're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us. We're thankful for the first day of the week that we can assemble together to worship Thee. We're thankful, Father, for this congregation, for each one present this morning. We pray for those who are not able to be with us because of sickness and other reasons. We pray especially for those we just mentioned on our sick list. We pray especially for those in, in Africa, the, the two men that are in charge of the offering home there. We pray that they might recover from the COVID and, and be able to continue to, to watch over those children in the home. Father, we're thankful for this East Hill congregation, for the many works that we're involved in. We pray that much good will come from it. We pray, Father, that we'll always have a, soul, a heart for saving lost souls. We're thankful for those who are teaching this morning. We're thankful for our young people. As they listen, we pray that they'll gain a better knowledge of your word and will be faithful Christians one day. Father, forgive us of our sins. Be with us now as we open your word and study from it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to begin with verse 11 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Last week we closed our lesson in, in uh, verse 10. We saw where these prophets had made uh, a detailed search to determine the nature and the time of the events that which they had predicted. We also mentioned that David had, uh, had asked an angel for information to have a better understanding in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 16. And we noticed that the, the prophets had prophesied of the grace that would come to men. And this morning as we begin in verse 11 of chapter 1, Verse 11 reads, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it's testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. <clears throat> Again, reference is made to the diligent and careful search of the prophets made into their own writings to learn the significance of of what they predicted. Here is an amazing glimpse into the consciousness of these Old Testament prophets. First, they were aware that the message they delivered was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they struggled to understand the who and the when of what they had predicted would take place. The nature of their search uh, to understand was a reference to, a, to what time and what matter of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. The Greek word for what time, chronos, simply means duration. And the Greek for matter of time, kairos, describes the seasons or periods into which time is divided. Both of these words are seen in the Lord's reply uh, to the request from his disciples about information regarding the establishment of the church. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, the Lord said, It is not for you to know time or seasons which the Father has set within his own authority. The prophets here are searching for the time when the events mentioned would occur. Or in failing in that, the dispensation or the age in which they could be expected. So the matters that they appeared to be most interested in and most concerned with were the date and circumstances of the Lord's coming, as well as the fulfillment of the redemption, the scheme of redemption. They knew that they were speaking about the coming of Christ, but they had many questions in their mind uh, about Christ which were unanswered. Verse 11 says the prophets testified, or they bore witness beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow by the Spirit of Christ which was in them. Of course, the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 verse 9, 
And from this fact, uh, we see these other thoughts develop. Uh, number one, the Holy Spirit dwelt in the prophets, directed their thoughts, and supplied the revelations which they revealed. And number two, if you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, we read here that knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So number two here is the same spirit that influenced the apostles and, and, and inspired men of the New Testament operate, or, operated in the same way uh, in the Old Pe Testament period of time. And number three, the spirit of Christ having been in the prophets, it follows that Christ existed during the times of the prophets. And this verse comes a, becomes an important text in support of the deity and pre-existence of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit began testifying of the sufferings of Christ more than 700 years before Christ came. The plural, the word sufferings in the plural form reminds us of all the painful experiences that our Lord went through while here on, on earth. Perhaps Peter worded it this way as a means of encouraging his readers. It was prophesied that Christ would go through sufferings on the way to heaven. And that's the way Peter is asking us to travel also. Verse 11 concludes with the words, the glory that will follow or should follow. Uh, this is the second point in Peter's uh, two-point summary of the Old Testament prophecies. First came the sufferings, then the glories, and then the triumphs which came to Christ, including his resurrection, his ascension, his coronation, and his reign at the right hand of God now. Verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things. As the prophets spoke of their prophecies and then struggled to understand, this much was revealed to them, that the fulfillment would not be in their lifetimes or for their benefits, but in the coming ages and with reference to other people. The prophets, like Abraham, rejoiced to see the day of Christ. John 8, 56 says they saw it by faith and were glad. But they saw it in a far distance. They wanted to see and hear what the apostles saw and heard, but that time had not yet gotten here. Matthew 13, 16, and 17. They did minister to things. Uh, the Greek word here for minister means to serve or to wait on, like maybe uh, you might think of spreading uh, food on a table for others to, to come and partake of. Uh, what the prophets were predicting about salvation has now come true in the lives of those readers of this letter from Peter. The prophets predicted what to them was some unknown t feature, uh, unknown future time period. But Peter says that time they predicted and then wanted to know about is now here. Verse 12 says, which, which are now reported unto you. The Greek says here that they minister the same things which have now been preached to you. The word now here uh, indicates a contrast between the time when the prophets lived and the time when the readers of this letter lived. 
the pr things preached when the readers of this letter lived, the things believed by those who became, became Christians were the very things predicted by these Old Testament prophets. By them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, verse 12. Who it was that preached the gospel to the readers of this epistle, uh, Peter doesn't specify. He simply states that they were empowered in their preaching by the Holy Ghost who was sent from heaven. Uh, this, this leads us to believe that the same spirit which motivated the prophets had led the apostles and others to preach the fulfillment of that which the prophets had predicted. So no wonder these messages matched. And verse 12 concludes with these, this thought, which things the angels desire to look into. The, the which things here refer to the, refers to and includes the matters of prophecy and their fulfillment in the Christian dispensation. We referred to in verses 10, 11, and 12 here. Uh, these things, the angels, these ministering spirits were sent forth to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit the salvation. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They desired to look into, they had their hearts set on, they were deeply concerned and interested in this salvation. The words look into here are from the Greek word means to stoop down in order to look. This same word was used when Peter stooped down to look into the empty tomb of our risen Lord in Luke 24 and verse 12. This passage here in verse 12 describes uh, the angels as having a strong desire to look into the depths of redemption because of the fact that angels had no provision for salvation. They were outside the realm of redemption. They had no grace, no offer of pardon for their sins. They were simply cast out of heaven. In verse 13, we will see an exhortation to hope. An exhortation to hope. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word gird here is from a Greek word meaning to gather up loose garments by means of a belt or a girdle. Uh, this is a reference to the style of dress uh, that was characteristic in this first, peri first century period of time when these people needed to run or to work or, or partake in certain activities. They would gather up that loose clothing and secure it with a belt so that it would not hinder them in, in whatever they uh, were about to do. The usage here is figurative, though, and refers to the gathering up of all improper thoughts and feelings and restraining them so that the way they will not hinder or hold back our progress towards heaven. Verse 13 says, Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Two exhortations are given here. One is to be sober. Two is to hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you. The soberness that is mentioned here is that which reveals itself in self-control and is a soberness that is produced by calmness of your mind and spirit. Someone who is sober-minded shows great control over their temper. They control their thoughts and have a calm attitude towards things that might irritate them. 
Paul in Acts chapter 6 and verse 25 exhibited so soberness when he was charged with being a fanatic about preaching the gospel. Paul says, I am not mad, most excellent Festus, but speak forth words of truth and soberness. The hope uh, to which the apostles mentions to the end is made up of expectation and desire combined into an attitude that's unwavering or lacking nothing. This hope is directed towards grace indicating the constant reaching which should be a characteristic of all faithful Christians. The phrase that this is to be brought is the, is the grace that, will, that we will obtain at the revelation of Christ when he comes to judge the world. In verses 14 and 15, we will see an exhortation to holiness. Verse 14 reads, As obedient children, not fastening yourselves according to the lust of your ignorance. As obedient children is an expression often occurring in not only Hebrew but other Oriental languages in which matters closely related are presented concerning the relationship which exists between a child and his parents. Because of that, as obedient children, a child belongs to and has inherited the nature of his parents. And this means of expression it often appears in Scripture, such as Ephesians 5 and verse 8, where it says children are light. Uh, children of this world in Luke 16 and verse 8. Son of perdition in Second Thess Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. This phrase, uh, as obedience children, uh, emphasizes the necessity of obedience to, to sonship, that relationship of father to son. And it's pointing to the fact that one becomes a child through obedience and in obedience continues as a child. The blessings and the, and the hopes and the joys of sonship, of that relationship, cannot exist in the absence of obedience. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not fastening yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Uh, the words not fastening yourselves we, refers to a common tendency that to allow the world to affect our, uh, our speech and our dress and our manner of life. Uh, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, the warning is against the conformity to the age. And here it is to the manner of life which these to whom Peter wrote had uh, followed before they had obeyed the gospel. Uh, this warning is certainly important. The temptation to take part in the morals and inappropriate conduct of those around us is certainly uh, dangerous and something that we must resist. Moses had something to say along this line of thought in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2. And wrote, Moses wrote, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Reference is made to former lusts in the time of your ignorance here in this verse. And that's a description in some ways to the lies of the Jews before they obeyed the gospel. Uh, these are also terms uh, associated to the Gentiles as applied to them in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. That verse reads, In the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The Jews regarded the Gentiles as ignorant. In fact, the New Testament writers describe the entire life of mankind whether Jews or Gentiles, before the appearance of Christ is a period of ignorance. 
and it should be considered in determining the guilt of those who lived at that time. Uh, concerning the Gentiles, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, Paul wrote that this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The Jews were also regarded as ignorant, though they were in the possession of the oracles of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 1 speaks of the Jews being committed the oracles of God. For the ignorance of the Jews and the Gentiles uh, they were both characterized as this, but were, were different in their character. The ignorance of the Jew uh, consisted of a blindness with reference to the true character of Christ and his reign, and not of the moral law, the type of ignorance that referred to by Peter here. Uh, the Jews were in possession of the law and the prophets, and thus had a familiar uh, were, were familiar with the will of God as given in the Old Testament scriptures. But the ignorance referred to by Peter was a characteristic of Gentiles prior to their obedience to the gospel and was a reference to moral conduct. And the ignorance that uh, which possessed them and by which they were motivated, they indulged, as verse says, in lust. Uh, the word lust here means a passionate desire. And th in this context here is descriptive of an evil desire. In verse 15, Peter writes, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Back in verse 1, Peter wrote to those he described as elect. Here he referred to those as having been called. God called through the gospel. Whereunto ye call you by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 says. And the gospel is addressed to all men in all nations, Matthew 20 verse, uh, chapter 18 verse 18 through 20. So it follows that all who heed the call before become through their obedience the called of God, the elect of God. The blueprint of God's calliness is holiness, the sanctification of someone's entire life to God. This holiness to which all are called is essentially a separation from a life of, of habitual sin and worldly worldliness. The words sanctify, sanctification, saints, holy, and holiness all derive from the same root word, hagias, and have related meanings. Here God is a perfect example to holiness, is set forth for us to desire all manner of conversation or living. The verb be here literally means to become, to become ye holy, suggesting the ushering in of one into a new state. And verse 16 says, because it is written. Uh, written is a perfect passive verb form, which implies something was written in the past and still stands true today. Peter's call to holiness is nothing new. It was a clear part of God's recorded will for his people. The word, it is written, is the regular way Old Testament passages are cited in New Testament writings. The verse that we're about to quote here, verse 16, can be found several times in the book of Leviticus, where God told his people, he expected them to be different from the nations around them. 
And verse 16 is quoted from uh, Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, Leviticus 19 and verse 2, uh, Leviticus 20 and verse 7 and verse 26. Verse 16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. These words on occasions were addressed to priests. And Peter regarded all Christians as priests. At other times, uh, he regarded the whole nation of Israel as priests. As the Israelites were required to be a holy nation and a peculiar people in the midst of all nations, so are the chosen people of the Lord required to be separate from the world. It should be a characteristic of every quick Christian to imitate the God that we worship. It should be, and it must be, our aim and goal to be perfecting holiness in our lives as we grow more and more into the image of God. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 speaks of the cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In verse 17 through 21, we will see an exhortation to reverence. In verse 17 reads, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. The word if is not to be taken as indicating doubt, but rather as an introduction of a condition which establishes a definite responsibility. It's nearly the same word as sense. Uh, the meaning is sense, or in as much as you call on the name of the Lord. And while the, fa uh, the idea of the fatherhood of God is, is mentioned for the purpose of eliminating the idea of judgment, it does tell us, tells us a comforting fact, and that is that our judge is also our father. So in this verse, we learn that, number one, our Heavenly Father is our judge. And number two, the judgment is to be according to every man's works. And number three, it is to be conducted without respect to persons. In other words, with complete fairness and impartiality. There are a number of passages in the Bible that call attention to God's impartiality. And Peter is speaking in, in Acts, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 mentions this. As well as the book of Romans chapter 2 verse 11, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9, and Colossians chapter 3 and verse 25, all speaks of God's impartiality, his no respect of persons. God doesn't judge on the basics of visual characteristics such as our wealth, a, a, a person's cultural background, or one's social position, but he judges with reference to their work. When we read uh, in the Bible about God's judging according to works, the word is usually in the plural form, but here it's singular. Now, this doesn't mean that God selects only one work. Uh, it means the singular word work here uh, says that he takes into effect the sum and the substance of man's entire life. And based on these assumptions, those to whom Peter wrote were instructed to pass their time of the sojourning in fear. In this word, sojourning, there is a continuation of the thought drawn from the relation of God as Father. Uh, the fact that God is indeed the Father of his children, and heaven where God is, John 14, 2, 
uh, becomes his children's permanent home. We are but sojourners and pilgrims here on earth. Hebrews 11, verse 13. But when we have safely reached our heavenly home, when the pilgrimage is over, then the exhortation to live in fear will no longer be needed. The fear is like the awe of obedient children towards their parents. It's a fear of displeasing or disappointing, uh, the fear of causing pain in someone uh, that we love. It's, a, it's such a fear that God approves and which faith, uh, faithful Christians feel. It's the Psalm chapter 111 and uh, verse 10 says, It's the fear of the Lord which is the beginning of wisdom. And Proverbs 1 and verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Such fear is not like uh, an attitude of cowardice, but it's an emotion which, above all else, uh, we fear might displease God. In verse 18, it reads, For as much as you know that you were redeemed with the corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 16 contains the an admonition to holiness, to godly living, founded on the example of God himself. And verse 17 is an exhortation to godly fear based on the fact of a judgment conducted with impartiality and without respect of persons. Here in verse 18, there's an argument for holiness from the belief of the redemption which has been attained for us from the bondage of sin at such a tremendous cost. The word redeemed here in verse 18 is from the word lutros, uh, the Greek word means to set free by payment of a ransom and was often used in the days of slavery to indicate the act of obtaining freedom uh, for, for slaves by way of a payment for their release. Uh, Peter had heard this word ransom used uh, from the Lord during his earthly ministry. In Matthew 20 and verse 28, the Lord mentions to giving his life a ransom for many. But here, perhaps more clearly than anywhere else in the New Testament is revealed to us the chief purpose of redemption, that being the, 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 the deliverance of us from all sin. And this establishes uh, the fact of suffering for, an, for another, uh, that Jesus gave his life, not only in our behalf, but actually instead of us. And so his death became the satisfaction of our sins. It also teaches us that the freedom that is received is not only a freedom from the penalty of sin, but from a sinful life itself. This is the, the ground that Peter based his exhortation for a life of godliness and holy living. Uh, the central idea here is a common one in the New Testament, and uh, such as, uh, for you are bought with a price, in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, the master that uh, bought, bought him in 2 Peter 2, 1, uh, Galatians 3 and verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. We must also remember that we have been freed from the slavery of sin and the price that was paid was not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the blood of the Son of God. Uh, silver and gold were two of the most treasured form of currency at that time, but, but there was not, uh, there's not enough of these coins in the world 
to purchase the redemption from sin. The matter of life from which uh, they had been delivered through the ransom which had been made for them is described as vain and as having been received by tradition from their fathers. The word vain uh, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 15 is used to describe idolatrous practices. And here it appears that reference is made primarily to the Gentiles who before their conversion to Christianity had been engaged in idolatrous worship and then they passed that on to their children. But with the precious blood of Christ, verse 19 says, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. This phrase uh, finishes the contrast begun in verse 18. That being the word precious is in contrast with the, with the corruptible things. The word precious is applied to something uh, costly, something very valuable. And we see it used in Revelation a couple of times. In Revelation chapter 18 and verse 12, it talks about the most precious wood. And then Revelations 21 and verse 11, it speaks of a stone most precious. With the precious blood, the blood is in contrast with silver and gold mentioned in the last verse and is, a, is more valuable than these metals and it accomplishes uh, that which silver and gold cannot. It, it can ransom our souls from the guilt of sin. In comparing the blood of Christ with that of a lamb without spot and without blemish, the doctrine of atonement uh, through the sacrifice of Christ and by means of his shed blood is clearly taught. Peter had heard it stated earlier by John the Baptist in John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. Well, Peter had heard this from John the Baptist, and he repeats it and gives emphasis to it, uh, to that here. The law of Moses required that all sacrifices uh, be without blemish and without spot, so that in them there would be no impurity or defilement whatsoever. In any atonement, uh, it's necessary that the sacrifice itself be free of the impurity it is designed to make amends for. And Jesus Christ certainly met uh, this requirement, uh, being with, completely without sin. He was without spot, without blemish, undefiled by the world, and unstained by all the evil that was around him while he was on this earth. In view of the price paid and the freedom from sin that is gained by this price uh, we are exhorted in these last two verses to live as children of God ought to live verse 20 reads who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you the word who here in this verse, of course, refers to Christ who was foreordained before the foundation of the world. The American Standard Version uses the word foreknown here. Foreknown means, of course, to know before. And Peter is telling us that Christ is the center of the plan of salvation in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. The Greek word here for foundation uh, means the first part of a building. The foundation here indicates the beginning, and, the, and in the text here refers to the beginning of the world. The word world is from a Greek word cosmos, meaning an orderly system, system an age, or dispensation and is often replied to, uh, to the uh, Mosaic age. Examples of this would be in Luke chapter 11 and verse 50 and Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. So Christ, uh, before the beginning of the Mosaic age, 
before the system of sacrifices originated, was ordained by God to suffer as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. And the Mosaic Age was planned and its animal sacrifices provided as types and shadows of the redemption awaiting through Christ. Christ as a lamb, mentioned in verse 18, was foreknown as such before the beginning of the sacrificial system was manifested, manifested verse 20 says, uh, before it was made known in these last times. In other words, near the close of the age whose sacrifices pointed to Christ's own death. And such provisions as Peter, such provisions were as Peter writes here for you, uh, the revelation being for all mankind. When mankind sees and understands that God planned in advance for our benefit, then we will even have even more reason to conduct ourselves in reverence to him. Our time is, is gone. We're like about one minute, I think. So we'll start here. Uh, well, we'll start here in verse 21 in two weeks. Next Lord's Day, Brother Bill Irby will be here. and will be teaching the class and preaching in the morning and at night for us. So next, in two weeks, we'll begin at verse 21. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>